Digital Foundry is sponsored by the powerful, upgradable MSI MPG Infinite X2 desktop PC, featuring Intel Core processors and NVIDIA RTX 40 series graphics. It's that time again, everyone. Digital Foundry's Graphics of the Year Award. We're going to talk about our favorite picks for the best visuals in 2023. And normally, it's just me and Alex. And Alex, you're here today. Hi there, John. Yes, I'm here. I've got Windows 95's 3D Labyrinth running in the background. I've got my Christmas hat, my yearly Christmas hat, which definitely doesn't just lie around in the dust till this very moment. And I pick it up again. It's definitely clean. Yeah, I'm sure it's extremely clean. But somebody who is extremely clean uh, that we also have joining us for the first time ever on the Graphics of the Year Award, the man who has added so much to Digital Foundry this year. Uh, we love to have you on, Oliver. Welcome to Graphics of the Year. Uh, thanks so much, John. It's uh, always a pleasure to be on even at this late hour. And yeah, I happen to cover quite a few of these games this year, so, so it should be fun yes. to, to chat about them. Exactly. So... That's what we're doing. This is bigger than the Game Awards. Uh, this is the most important so. awards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe not, but we're going to try. We're going to try anyway, and here's how it's going to go. We've we've broken this up into three distinct segments, the first one being honorable mentions. These are games that we feel look really good uh, and deserve a mention, but perhaps don't make the top of the list for reasons we'll discuss when going over the games. And then we get to our top 10, where we will present the first seven of this 10 in an unordered fashion. But this year, when we get to the top three, we're going to fight to see which order they go in. One, two, three. It's going to be discussed right here between the three of us. We have not predetermined which one's going to take the actual top spot yet. So I can't wait to get into that. So, guys, are you ready to start with honorable mentions? Absolutely. Let's do a job. All right. So. Number one on this list, even though I just said it's unordered, it's not actually ordered. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Dead Space. It's Dead Space, the remake of Dead Space that came out earlier this year, powered by Frostbite. This is a beautiful retelling of the original Dead Space game uh, with gorgeous visuals focused on dynamic lighting and shadows and just awesome atmosphere. It has a few issues that we've discussed about, specifically on the PC, but I think it's a pretty solid looking game. I mean, what do you think, Alex? Yeah, this is one where I loaded it up on PC and actually even on the consoles because we were back when we were like loading it up, we were talking about the VRS stuff and we, I had to load it up on the consoles too to see what was going on uh, with John when John was doing his video. And I was just surprised kind of everywhere I played it that it looked really, really good. I'm a big fan of the fact that it relies pretty much wholly on dynamic lighting and yeah. that has some issues in its own right at times but it's it's ambitious to see games uh push dynamic lighting so much as part of the core design and the game really requires it i mean it's doom 3-esque in that regard where you go in a room and the lights are off and then they turn on or vice versa um so yeah i really like that and i think it would held up to the same artistic standard as the original which was already really good looking back when it came out in 2008 yeah I think it's really good when you go between the two games because it feels like they've done such a good job of maintaining that original game spirit while totally redoing the artwork. Like you'd be surprised when you're comparing between them how much they've changed. And I agree, like they, there's so much focus on real time lighting, but my only quibble with the game, at least in its current state on, on consoles really, is the fact that there's like very little representation of GI or bounce or anything yeah. like that. Yep. That's, that's yep. the only quibble yep. there. And maybe they could have improved that. Obviously you're targeting a pretty high spec of hardware relative to what they used to be targeting. So it would have been nice to see some progress in that front, but I think it looks overall really, really good. I love the artwork. I love what they've done with it, and uh, it's some of my best games of the of the year. So I really enjoyed the game as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is an interesting thing where it came out with RTAO, which almost feels like uh, the opposite of what you'd want in Dead Space. Yeah, you know right? what I mean? Because it's got like uh, shiny sci-fi surfaces, and it's got. Uh, lights of lots of intense little short lights in dark areas where you'd imagine where bounce lighting like GI would be the thing you put in, but I guess RTAO was like the short, easy, not easy. It was in the engine. <laughs> RT. It was in the engine already, so it made sense to put it in the game without investing too much research time and development effort in something like GI or reflections. Agreed. But mm -hmm. all right, next game. Uh, this one's a little different. And it's Horizon Forbidden West's Burning Shores DLC. Technically speaking, if this had been the year of this game, and this is what the game looked like, obviously, as it was 
last time, it would be right at the top of the list, right? But this is just DLC. It doesn't overhaul the entire render. If it had, say, added path tracing or something, maybe it would have been much different. But Mm -hmm. I do feel we needed to mention this, at least, Mm -hmm. because I do think Burning Shores is a phenomenal piece of DLC, and it you know, it takes the already great visuals that we saw in Forbidden West and pushes it even further. And Oliver, I think you did the video for this one. I did, yeah. I would say that the updated cloud rendering is like the standout visual feature here. Basically, the game has a new voxel-based uh, 3D cloud system relative to the uh, Forbidden West cloud system, which I think was called their Nubus cloud system. This one right. is really great because you can fly up next to the clouds and they maintain coherency and they have defined structures in them. You can fly through them, you can f- fly through pockets in them, and it still like holds up really, really well at close range. The lighting is amazing, like when light penetrates the cloud edges, it just looks fantastic. So I think that's like the really key technical advancement. But yeah, outside of that, it's just the same great game that you would have seen last year but with the new map, different setting, more emphasis on flying and the the clouds, of course. Precisely. Alex, do you have anything to say on this one? Have you checked it out? Uh, I haven't checked it out personally, but I watched Oliver's video, and I think that also was for me the standout part. A lot of things that games get away with that have volumetric clouds is that there's just the conceit that they're always on the horizon and you can never actually move along with them. And that that makes them cheaper to render. But if you have to fly in a game, you can't do that. It was just so awkward. So them moving to this much more, I would call it like Red Dead Redemption 2 style slash Microsoft Flight Simulator style of rendering for their clouds. uh, It benefited the game hugely. It also makes me wonder what they're going to be doing next, if it's more Horizon or something else. I would love to see them take a first person game again where they would have to really push the detail even further. I think we already know the answer. Like we don't yeah. actually know, but we know. We probably it's, know the answer. It's going to yeah. be more Horizon almost yeah. certainly. But hey, you know what? Those are beautiful games. Guerrilla Games pushes the limits on consoles for sure. Definitely one of the best in the biz uh in terms of visual design. So, yeah, there it is. Next one though is of a very different scale, I would say, and that is Jusong which is a game that was released towards the end of summer, I believe. And it was one of the first in the round of earlier UE5 titles that took advantage of its features. And I think this is a big standout game for showcasing Lumen Mm -hmm. in action Mm -hmm. because it's a game that uses, so essentially you're climbing like a large obelisk, if you will, over the course of the game. And it charts your exploration to the top. Uh, It has an awesome sense of scale and a really cool visual design. It's kind of like, uh, you know... It has aspects of realism, but it's it's definitely you know, stylized, shall we say. But mm-hmm. thanks to Lumen, you get all the beautiful bounce lighting all over the place. And there's different rock formations and the materials, as simple as they may be, like it really allows it to shine in a way. And you see that beautiful bounce lighting and the color transfer all over the place. And there's deep, the combination of the deep orange from the sun with the deep blues and some of those like cavernous like spots of the tower like it's genuinely beautiful i think i mean what do you think alex you've played this one right yeah yeah and i uh i really wanted to highlight it originally because i thought in comparison to most it was the game where you could see global illumination effects really well and one thing that i really liked too in the game and oliver definitely saw this too when he talked about it for the console version is that lumen gi has its limitations like especially in its software form and they worked heavily to make sure that they don't show up too often yep. or they had modified it. Like in a number of scenes, they'll place an artist light uh, to fake the GI getting like better, like shadow coverage in an area, like at the entrance of the mouth of a cavern. They'll also, along with GI coming in, they'll throw like a light in there that is like projecting real time shadows, uh, those VSM shadows into the environment. And it looks really good as a result. They, it was a team that knew what their limits were and they worked the art around it. And I think that is one of the big strengths of doing tech art in a game is knowing the limitations of what you're doing and not and like not showing the hand all the time yep. of where the limitations yeah. are. And 100%. I think they did a really good job of that. I also think it's just one of my favorite UE five games so far, just in terms of showing off Lumen GI, because it's got like this gray box, almost like textureless uh, clay kind of style to it. So you really see all that fine lighting detail because there's so little texture detail to kind of cover it up. So it's it's Mm -hmm. just a really nice showcase for what uh, UE5 can do, I think. Absolutely. So that's why it gets a mention here, I think. It's not necessarily pushing the limits of Unreal Engine 5 just yet, but it's 
one of the showcase titles. There is another one on this list. Yeah, there is another one on this list that we'll get to later. But uh, there we go. Our first UE5 title. I think ever. Wait, was Fortnite on there last year? I can't remember. It was. It was It was part of the list just last year, but we all didn't right, put all it right. towards the top. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, uh, we have two more honorable mentions. Uh, and one of them, the next one here, is one I included on the list. And it's Armored Core 6. And you're probably thinking, what the heck, John? Why is there a From Software game on, on a list like this? And it's because I think graphics go beyond just pure tech. And I think Armored Core 6 shows that what from software does even if they're not pushing the boundaries of technology they know how they know how to utilize their tech in combination with their art to create truly stunning looking games and armored core 6 i think has one of the best depictions of scale i've ever seen in a game where just the way they lay out the terrain in front of you with all these like mechanical structures stretching way off into the horizon above the player uh, it's beautiful and nightmarish all at once. And just the combination of the, the striking lighting, the mech designs themselves, the, you know, all this kind of stuff. It, it just looks so beautiful in motion on, you add in things like the animation work, the particle effects, like all that stuff, it just comes together in the symphony of destruction. Uh, and then there's, you know, early on, there's this one mission where you're like tackling like a, a giant walker and this thing is is huge it is the level itself on top of the terrain it's fully uh, animated as well you take down one of its legs and actually climb up and fly around on top of this thing as it's moving through the desert and they've they've tried this stuff in some of the ps3 era of armored core games but like i feel like six finally truly pulls it off in a way that doesn't feel kind of compromised by the technology you know mm. And yeah, that's just, that's what they do. I mean, did either of you guys actually play this? No. No, I didn't have time. Oh. But the one thing I also uh, want to finally commend them on is that they've, uh, unlike with Elden Ring and every Dark Souls release on PC before this, <laughs> is it actually uh, is competent. Like, Dark Souls 2 was competent enough. Uh, but uh, this one, like, actually unlocking the frame up, up to 120, that was just missing before. Using new APIs without, quote unquote, sorry, Oliver, for the bleeping sh in the bed. Um, <laughs> you know, like Elden Ring does not properly use D3D 12 when it launched. And this one did and didn't seem to have issues. In fact, this That's is probably right. the first time in a while where I'd say, like, actually, the PC version is probably the best way to play this game. Oh, absolutely. By, by and a good mile. You know, so. it just it just runs like butter. You load it up, mm -hmm. it just goes. And even better. This thing has amazing mouse and keyboard controls. I actually think playing this game with mouse and keyboard is the best way to experience it. So, I mean, it's it's good on any platform you play it on, I would argue. Well, maybe not last gen, but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, PC version is the way to go. And that's why it's on the list. But our next one, though, the final honorable mention, this is a little bit different because it's even less pushing technical boundaries. But, well... Actually, in a way, it maybe is. It's pushing the boundaries of the Switch because it's Metroid Prime Remastered, which is uh, one of my favorite games, I think. It would be in my top 20 list of all time, probably. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Metroid Prime. I love what they've done with it. And they remastered it for Switch this year. And my goodness, I think they did a phenomenal job. Uh, not only does it sort of, you know, bring the rendering up to speed with where you would expect like a somewhat more modern game, but it does it all at 60 frames per second with reasonable image quality on the switch. Mm -hmm. And it winds up being, I think one of the better looking, one of the best looking switch games like ever made, I would say when yeah. you, especially mm -hmm. when you take into account how well it runs. And I think Oliver, you actually got to do the video on this one, if I recall, right? I did. Yeah. Um, if anything, I'd, I'd want to highlight the lighting in particular, because there's some really effective uh, baked lighting in this title. And I kind of speculate here that they're really putting that four gigabytes of RAM or three gigabytes usable uh, on the Switch to good use, because they have that segmented world design. And I feel like they're really able to oh, crank yeah. up the fidelity of the baked lighting. Like the baked lighting in here, some of it looks like way better than in a lot of other titles that we see on current gen consoles. So I was super yeah, impressed yeah, by right. that. They've basically re-arted the entire game, a lot like uh, Dead Space, which we discussed earlier. New models, textures, everything redone, uh, PBR materials. They've done a great job of maintaining the look of the game, but with totally new assets everywhere. 
And all the like novel effects from the original game pretty much have survived. So you get the flash of Samus's reflected face in the visor. You get the raindrops on the player weapon, all that good stuff. And on top of all that, it runs with, yeah, decent image quality, I would say, for a Switch title. And it, it basically a, a totally locked 60 FPS. So mm-hmm. amazingly, it's sort of right. funny because wow. when you look at some of these Switch titles that Nintendo puts out, you almost think, do we really need a Switch to? <laughs> Of course we do, <laughs> but it, yes, but it's yes. so good, you know, it's so good what they do on the platform. It it almost feels like a preview of what they've been trying to do with uh, Metroid Prime 4, which I do yeah, believe we'll see that, right? will still ship on the original Switch. Oh my gosh, that'd uh, be nuts. I'm, I'm fairly certain that's going to happen, but we'll see. Uh, but if it looks like this or better, which is possible, uh, well, I think I'd be pretty happy with that. But all right, gentlemen, those are our honorable mentions. So uh, that's and what makes them honorable mention is that they wouldn't normally get into the actual top 10 list. That's that's basically it. It's just like extending the list a little bit uh, <laughs> yeah. for, for games that we personally wanted to add that maybe not all of us have played or experienced. Um, but now it's time to get to the, I guess, th- four through 10 on the top <laughs> list. But this is actually out of order. We're going to debate, again, the top three to actually put those in a proper order when we get there. So let's go down the list. And there's a couple things in here that are a little bit like, I think all of these should be here. But this first one I want to mention, we debated on whether or not it should be included. But in the end, just due to the visual quality, I think it makes it. But there are caveats. And that Mm -hmm. is Jedi Survivor. We've had a contentious relationship with this game over the past year. Uh... (laughs) It is not good on the PC. They they have they launched it with major issues. It was very broken early on in many ways. Uh and I almost felt like it shouldn't be on here because of that. But then when you actually look at what they're doing visually speaking, I think it just makes the cut. Alex yeah. Why why don't you explain why? (laughs) Well, I mean, Oliver can also do it too, very briefly. But but one thing I want to say is, in spite of all of my issues with the game, I will say that I I really like the character rendering in it completely. I think it is visually, since Battlefront 2, even Battlefront 1, which maybe sometimes always looks a little better than Battlefront 2, um, is probably the best realization of Star Wars aesthetic in video games. I, I think they did a really, really good job. Wait, wait, wait. Better than Rebel Assault? Well, <laughs> yes. Better than Rebel Assault. Oh, all I'll right. Say. There we have it. I'll, I said it live. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think... They they were pushing the technology in in good ways. Um, the ray tracing is really nice to see and was not expected at all pre-launch. I wouldn't have expected a ray tracing at all. But I think it was just kind of in a package where it was held together by string in a lot of ways. And <laughs> yeah. that, that brought it down. And... But Oliver, you since you looked at it on consoles where you came away with it more impressed than I was because I was fending off all the issues on PC, on like PC. Yeah. take it away, yeah. I think the most impressive thing is just those cutscenes, which like at times mm-hmm. they look incredible, like they're super consistent, high quality, correct looking lighting and materials in those scenes, like almost CG level character models, incredible animation, just beautifully directed sequences. And a lot of like the smaller scale environments in the game look fantastic as well. Like just so much detail and complexity, like in that opening mission when you're being paraded through, uh, I think it's called Coruscant, just looks amazing, right? Outstanding. <laughs> that's what, okay. That's what, uh, there's there's a big joke about this, about how you pronounce it, but it's either Coruscant or Coruscant, depending okay. upon okay. which, which era not, of George I'm Lucas is talking. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I would say that the game itself like looks terrific, um, but... On PC, obviously, it's a huge letdown. On consoles, there were some issues. The biggest issue that I would say at launch was there were a lot of game-breaking bugs, um, a lot of crashes, visual issues. That was a big problem. But in addition to that, Mm -hmm. the performance mode just did not run at 60 FPS, and the image quality was quite poor in the performance mode. Eventually, like in September, I believe, they solved both of those issues to some degree by just removing all Mm -hmm. the ray tracing from the performance mode. (laughs) Improving performance and increasing the uh, internal resolution of the game. So that definitely improved things. The game on consoles, I think, now is pretty good. 
The performance mode is decent. The quality mode gets a 30 f uh, gets a consistent 30 fps and looks pretty good in terms of image quality. I would say, and you get those nice uh, RTGI and RT reflections on top of that. So I think it's in a pretty good state on consoles and it looks really good. But it's definitely had kind of a rough journey, and on PC it's still unacceptable. So it's kind of a mixed mm. commendation, mm. I think. Yeah, it's it's a hard one. It's it's like last year when we talked about uh, the Callisto Protocol, where at the time it was like f super fresh game, True. and we knew it had the visual quality. It was that was most painfully obvious, but the roughness of the launch really took a lot of the luster out of it. And that one got better over time. I would say much more rapidly, actually, than Jedi Survivor did. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially on the PC side, where it got like a lot, lot better within like a month. So yeah, it's like one of those things where the that we for a game to be good looking, it also has to be fluid, and that's like we can't look at a game that's stuttering and be like, this looks good. That's really hard for us. I think us at Digital yeah, Foundry. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. That's fair. I. I agree. I do think it's a great looking game for sure. And I do. I have not fully played through the game yet because I kept putting it off in hopes that the PC version would be fixed. But I've kind of lost that hope, and I'll just have to accept uh, a stable 30 FPS experience on the consoles, which I can deal with. That. That's fine. I, I'll give it a shot. Uh, but what I I've played through, you know, the first like four hours or so, and I do agree that it's absolutely gorgeous despite its technical problems. So, all right, next one then. And this one I kind of voted to put on the list because I think it looks really, really slick. It has a few limitations, but overall, beautiful game, fantastic art direction. That's Final Fantasy 16, mm -hmm. uh, which I covered back around launch. And I think this game is very, very polished and just showcases what like a strong presentation can do for a game like this. Uh, first of all, Oliver, you mentioned the cutscenes in Jedi Survivor, but I think the ones in 16 are perhaps yeah. even more just they're 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 bombastic, yes, but it takes me back to that feeling of watching what would have previously been like a pre-rendered sequence Absolutely. in an older yeah. game. And then they essentially translate that to a true real-time graphics engine with large-scale destruction in some of the scenes and just tremendous animation work. And it's really, 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 really beautiful to behold. But I think the game world itself does look largely great. They've done a lot with their baked uh, global illumination. So like the scenes are... Unlike a lot of Final Fantasy games, they went for a much a much more subtle art style. So like things like the way scenes are lit, it's far more, uh, I would say, realistic than like bombastic, but mm -hmm. very, very nice, very impressive. And like a lot of like subtle bounce lighting where you need it, you know, the shadows look great. That We were confused for so long about the shadows because it's like they look kind of like ray traced shadows and they behave mm -hmm. like it too, but it's not. And they just came up with a really clever solution. Uh, there's a whole presentation on there uh, that they did. I need to refresh myself on all those details, but mm -hmm. I think that holds up well. And then you get into things like the VFX, uh, which are incredible. The particle effects, the explosions, the motion blur, the scale of some of those scenes. The, there's that that one scene later on where you're uh, uh, f f going, you're fighting Kupka in his like oh, yeah. final form. I guess you could say right and like. It's fine running across the desert at like huge speed and like grappling with this Titan. Uh, it felt like old style God of war that we haven't had yeah. since like God of war three or something where yeah, it's just something really. that's way bigger than you and absolutely dominates the scene. And just the way that plays out, it just looks amazing. Uh, Oliver, I think you have experience with this title as well. Yeah. So. I love it. Uh, I, I beat it pretty early on. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, yeah. I mean, I love the character rendering in it. You get kind of like this blend between like Final Fantasy style kind of anime inspired yeah. visuals and kind of a stylized realism. Like you said, it's kind of somewhere in between. And I, I think the exactly. place they picked really suits the game and its themes and its visuals and all that. The materials look fantastic. Like when you look at like Benedicta's leather outfits and things like that, they just look really, really, really good. The shadow rendering, again, it's, it's super impressive there. Um, probably I'd have to say the visual highlight of the game would be those battle sequences which i think yeah. were uh co-produced with the help of platinum games which i think shows in some of those yeah, bigger oh, really? sequences when you're mm -hmm. fighting the icons i believe they're called like the elemental gods in the game the spell effects animations 
everything looks amazing. It's so polished. And for me personally, uh, when I was kind of growing up, uh, Final Fantasy 13 was like a really big game for me. I was so impressed by that title. And a lot of what they accomplished with CGI in Final Fantasy 13, I think has been realized or is close to being realized in real-time visuals, specifically finally, in this game. Yeah. I think they've done a tremendous job and all that stuff. So to have something that finally approaches that level of quality and style in real time feels like super special. Mm -hmm. And I think Alex will get a chance to try it out next year, I suppose, yeah, I think because it, I think uh, it is coming to the PC. Yeah, that's true. And I'm, I'm really curious what they're going to uh, change or add to it because, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it's it's hard to say because with final, we had the Final Fantasy VII remake on PC, which I, so I Oliver ended up covering <laughs> that, but, I, you know, it has issues. But this time, I think since they were so technically minded and it's a different their team. Own. It's their own engine it, as well. It's their own engine. Yeah. I think it's going to be very different. I think it's going to be just as polished, if not more so. Uh, one thing that you're going to be able to do is play it at 60 FPS without yes. any image quality concerns, which is, yes. this was like yeah. one of the first titles this year to really have like a controversial, well, not one of the first, but it definitely was controversial with the fact that 60 FPS was not always maintained. And then the image quality you had to deal with in 60 FPS on the PlayStation 5 wasn't super hot. So that's one thing. Yeah. And I, I look forward to covering it. Definitely. I, w I would love to see them push something like reflections in the game a little bit further, uh, but right. everything else is already looking great. Yep. I completely agree. And yeah, the performance mode was kind of like the one real minus yeah. feature on here is that, you know, the image quality suffered a lot and it was not consistent. And as I noticed, you know, they were, they did at least push for more stable frame rates in combat, but that, meant dropping to like 720p yeah. to get there. that was kind of weird too like why target right. variable performance at the expense of ugh, just not, not my favorite it, it was expense, so yeah. in 30 fps mode though i thought it looked still very good and the motion blur especially was extremely well done i know some people did not love it at first and they did add a slider but i loved all that motion blur that's what made it look very cgi like in action i think so all right uh, next on the list then, and this is another one that I think, I know Oliver and I have played the heck out of this game, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's Robocop, Robocop Rogue City. This is from Taeon and they have done prior games based on films. They did a not so great Rambo game, but then they did the <laughs> awesome Terminator game. And this one I think is their best yet. It perfectly recreates the experience that one might envision after having watched RoboCop uh, of playing as RoboCop while still I'd say staying true to some of the themes of the original film, which is actually tricky business. If you're going to empower the player to play as RoboCop, but then also, you know, stick the message, stick to the message. That's tough. I think they did about as good of a job as you could ask and probably the best that anyone has ever done with RoboCop specifically. With RoboCop. Yeah. I don't definitely. think any game has actually pulled off RoboCop at this level before and that's great but it's also a game that uh it utilizes unreal engine 5 and i personally feel that this is the best looking unreal engine 5 game despite some it has some polish issues likely related to budget specifically with the cutscenes and the character rendering that's fairly mediocre i would say it's serviceable but mediocre but the actual worlds that they built they've basically sort of recreated many of the sets from the original film and expanded upon them in an interesting way to create real levels to explore uh, the way it uses lumen to light for light and reflections uh, it produces this very filmic like result that's both highly realistic but still also very true to the source material i would say visually mm -hmm. yeah and then a lot of the scenarios they put you in are just cool to behold visually like when you fight Ed 209, for instance, the way it's like there's so much destruction uh, in the environment, right? And mm -hmm. you're kind of chipping away at him, shooting him down. There's the scene where the guys on motorcycles come out early in the game, yeah. right? And it's extremely fun to, you know, you're shooting guys off the motorcycles. You run up to him, you grab one off his bike and throw him at another pack of guys riding their bikes and everybody goes flying and explosions everywhere. It just looks so cool. Uh, Oliver, what do you think? Yeah, like you said, I think this game takes a spot on the list in large part because it uses the UE5 tool set so effectively. Like when you combine Lumen with VM VSMs 
In a game like this, you get some extremely compelling results. And I actually yeah. think that of the non-path trace titles on this list, this title has some of the most consistent lighting. Like in any scenario that you see in the game, there's just a really consistent and high quality presentation for the lighting. And I think it benefits a lot because a lot of the other UE5 titles that we've seen so far have been smaller scale games than this one. Mm -hmm. And they maybe are more limited by budget, whereas this is kind of like a double A style effort that has a bigger team. Right. And the results mm -hmm. they're able to achieve, even with kind of like a, a middle of the road kind of budget, which you do see, like John said, in the cutscenes, which uh, are a little robotic with <laughs> facial animations, yes. you know, a, a little out of date, let's say. It's fine. <laughs> like, but, not every game needs perfect cutscenes. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. care. But it, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think all that really makes you hungry for more games that use this technology and that use it in a really sophisticated way like Robocop does because I think we're going to see really tremendous results out of upcoming titles that do use it. And I, I think, like, specific to this game, also it does a really good job of replicating locations from the movies. I watched Robocop 1 right before I uh, started to work I, on I did the, same. the game. <laughs> yeah, And it, it's remarkable how, like, some locations, like the police station, they just mirror it almost perfectly. And I love that. I love how they yeah. recreate like that that shot from the film of like of Murphy driving back to police HQ. Yeah. Like, that <laughs> angled shot up showing the headquarters there. Like they perfectly nail yeah. that. Uh the the title card. There's sequence. so many callbacks, you know. Oh man. Yeah. I think they did a fantastic job on it. And uh I was just super impressed. Like I was not expecting that at all. I was just so impressed by that game. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I agree. Alex? Uh, I would say I like this because it shows how UE5 can be a force multiplier uh, if used correctly. Where Ooh, there's no way this there's there's no way this team if they move their own technology base could probably even produce anything like this. But since the tools are there and the high fidelity can be achieved by UE5, and they just have the right, uh, however they're doing their art, uh, however they're managing the scenes. They can produce something that looks in a lot of ways better than like AAA games. Yeah. Especially in terms of lighting quality. Uh, yeah, that stuff's sick. I, I loved a lot of the shots Oliver got for his video of like the, that one outdoor area and like the, the I don't know what they'd call them, like sand duny kind of garbage dump. I don't know what that was. <laughs> yeah. It looked awesome. Those, yeah. those rocks on the side. And all those little like nanite rocks and the incredibly crisp mm, yep. shadow detail. Yep. And the incredible amount of geometry, it just like all comes together to produce a result that you just will not see in another game this year, right? Just an nope. incredible yeah. result, I think. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, good job to Taeon. Uh, they did a amazing work on this game. It's it's really good stuff. Uh, and then, then our next title then on the list is another game using its own original engine. And it's an engine we've seen multiple times. And I think this might be the best looking game produced with it yet. It's Resident Evil 4 from Capcom, the remake. Uh, you know, obviously, I think we were all kind of nervous about them remaking Resident Evil 4, but I think they've created something that sits nicely alongside that original, uh, expands upon it in ways that you might like. Uh, I think they're both still, you know, they hold up on their own, but man, the visual quality in Resident Evil 4, they've went overboard with just that granularity of each environment the scenes are presented with just like there's barely a straight edge to be found well at least in the village areas right like mm -hmm. yeah. all these old crumbling structures with the with the wood beams and the stones and like just just everything around it it feels truly lived in and just it compels you to explore and just dive deeper into this world and it really helps build this place and thanks to the the way it's now laid out and it's more seamless, it actually does feel like like you're actually exploring sort of this this real space. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has, you know, it does have ray tracing features as well, which are nice, but uh, it doesn't even need it, frankly. I think it looks amazing without it as is. It's just, it's a game full of life, full of gorgeous lighting. Some of the best character models I think we've ever seen uh, in a game like this, mm -hmm. like they're just really, really good. Uh, it got better and it's also was fine on PC right out, right on day one, but the, there's the, uh, strand hair system, which mm -hmm. I think looks really great. Leon, of course, has his very, uh, 
his spectacularly sexy looking hair. What can I say? <laughs> it's, it's true that if there, there was sexy hair, it's Leon's exactly, hair. Exactly. <laughs> there's blonde locks sort of flowing behind him as he moves. I mean, frankly, they look good without the strand system, but when you add that in, it's it's very very nice. Uh, but yeah, what do you guys think? Uh, who have you played more of this? I assume Oliver. I, mm, I finished this uh-huh. game twice. And I'm playing it again now in PSVR oh, wow. 2, which I'll also mention. But I have not played this game twice, to say the least. <laughs> Oliver? Uh, I've played a fair bit of it, uh, at least quite a few hours in. Um, mm-hmm. I think it looks great. It's a great showcase for the RE engine. On PC in particular, I think at the moment, it's a very good experience. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great-looking game. I really do. But on consoles... I wasn't a huge fan of the way it was configured at launch, especially with the dead zone issues, the issues with uh, CA. On. Oh, I mean, the dead zone thing was sadly specific to Xbox. Xbox I yeah, would say. yeah. Xbox yeah. did have a problem with the controls, and they did fix it, I believe. Yeah, and then the, yeah, the it, CA it, it, issues on PS5, and then the, all the options right. on consoles, like how they pair in the, in the the hair and the reflections are toggleable separately, but then on Series S, they're all bundled into the resolution selection, and it was just very confusing. And then the screen space reflections, which they later seem to remove from the game, at least on Series X and <laughs> PS5, which I'm glad they did. Um, so I think it's a great-looking game. There were some configuration problems, at least the last time that I looked at the game, which was for patch 1.004, I think. There were still some remaining issues, so... I think it's it's a game that is let down a little bit um, by some configuration issues, specifically on consoles. But I think it's a fantastic looking title, and I think the RE engine is like hugely un- underrated. <laughs> like I think that the yeah, results I they agree. achieve with it, especially when you look at upcoming titles like Dragon's Dogma Two, I think they really punch above their weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is one where I, I liked it on PC for a lot of aspects, like the, the ability to scale higher than consoles. But it always feels like uh, a game where like they're putting a lot of effort into some aspects of the console versions and then there's some like strangely half-baked things on pc like yes uh you can get higher image quality on pc but you still have like taa that still doesn't work the way it should or like you have to use like a dlss mod or like the the texture options are very confusing to any user like seriously i i would be really surprised if anyone with like a 8 to 12 gigabyte gpu actually knows how to configure that option without spending hours doing it so this is one where i i really like the visual return but it's a little like it needs just needs a little bit more love to make sure like the rounded edges are like the the edges are not so rough and actually round it off like that's what i mean to say uh that's what i would love to see for the future titles and it seems like they are based on those re presentations like they mentioned how they're going to look at the like traversal stutters that those games have uh they mentioned how they're pushing ray tracing further uh they're looking at like frame health more and frame stability more according to these presentations too so it's like stuff that i really like to hear i mean that's good i i still think compared to many other PC releases here, the PC experience of this game was pretty damn good. Yeah, uh, and, I mean, it's I, it's better than what you got on consoles. That's for certain. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, playing it through on PC uh, with the mouse and keyboard also, it felt really good with mouse and keyboard, which I think was critical. Uh, something you can't guarantee with this sort of game. <laughs> I also think yep. it had spectacular HDR implementation. Uh, playing this, I, this was one of the first games I played when I switched to an OLED PC monitor. And playing through this in HDR and that it was, it almost set my expectations too high for HDR on the PC where like, it just looks so good. And then I switched to some other games and they're fine, but it just doesn't kick the same way. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a big fan, <laughs> but then <laughs> there's also the PSVR two stuff. I've been playing with that, not to go too much into detail on that, but I think, you know, when you look at what they're doing, on a console in VR, it's one of the most technically impressive looking VR games, I would say at the moment, because they managed to essentially keep that same level of visuals as like the normal non RT mode on consoles, but in VR. Right. And mm-hmm. while, it, while layering in all the expected features in VR, it plays sort of like the, the meta quest version of Resident Evil four. Uh, Mm -hmm. It takes some cues from that control scheme. I think it's smoother and better than Village was in VR. 
obviously there's a lot more action, which is great for VR with that. And it's pretty terrifying being chased around uh, by Chainsaw Man within there. So only complaint <laughs> with the VR version really is that it's 60 frames per second reprojected to 120. Uh, but and you, feel you, know, it? you get that double image effect, right? Oh, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which not not with the head movement the head movement looks like 120 but when you're actually like moving around the objects moving around the world you can tell like okay this is actually just 60 fps but given the visual quality the visual target and the fact that it's on console i think that's that's fair it's understandable that they couldn't get this up to say a native 90 frames per second on a ps5 right yeah so yeah i mean it makes sense at the end of the day exactly uh, this is one of those moments where, like, you you wish that there was a PC VR release or a I PS5 guess. Pro, oh, or a PS5 Pro, yeah. <laughs> maybe so. All right. Anyway, next title, and this is one I felt very strongly about needed to be on the list. Uh, it's a phenomenal game. It looks incredible. Mm-hmm. Hi-Fi Rush. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Tango GameWorks. I like the Evil Within one and two a lot, and this was completely out of left field, un- unexpected. Uh, it's basically a character action game set to music and some great music <laughs> as well. But I think this is one of the best examples I've ever seen of utilizing sort of this cell shaded, uh, duplicating the sort of an animation look uh, that I've seen since like, you know, Arc System Works did the Guilty Gear stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this this goes into full 3D worlds and environments. And first of all, there's the cutscenes, which use sort of decimated animation to produce like the 15 FPS style anime look. Uh, mm-hmm. Despite being real 3D, it focuses a lot on the keyframes to create individual frames that look and move like an actual like show, like a cartoon would look. Uh, and with the high image quality you get, and I think this is Unreal Engine 4, um, it just it's yeah, right. it, it pops. It looks amazing. Obviously, in-game, they do not keep the decimated animation, unlike, say, Guilty Gear, which tries to simulate like a 2D sprite-based fighting game. So... It feels fluid when you actually play the game, as it should. Uh, but I just think the scenery, the art direction, it's super eye-popping, ultra-vibrant. It runs like a dream. Image quality superb. Yeah. Uh, everything about this game just just speaks to me. It's it's a mm-hmm. stunning achievement. And Oliver, I think you did the video on this one as well. So I did. Yeah. I just think that the commitment to mimicking the look of 2D cartoon-style animation within 3D game content is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. You have the decimated animation, the characters have such bold and colorful and exciting designs, and it feels like the animations, especially in the cutscenes, are designed around like key poses, right? With interstitial animations and these really kind of bold, expressive movements, and it's just a, a sight to behold, I think. Um, and yeah, during gameplay, it's it's smooth because they drop a lot of those conventions, which I think is the right call for a game like this. Oh, yeah. Right. But yeah, yeah I, I think <laughs> I pretty much said what I wanted to say uh, in, in the video I produced in the game, but I was just blown away by the way it looks. And I think it's one of the most confident and assured titles that we've seen in a long time. And it also kind of feels very inventive in a way that I don't think we've seen too much of since like the PS2 era. It just feels like a yeah. super oh, old yeah. game that we just don't see that much of nowadays. Sadly not. Mostly in the no. indie space. So to have a first, yeah. pers- yeah. a first party publisher produce something like this, that's amazing. And Alex, yeah. obviously you have I, thoughts on it. Yeah, I loved it. I, I, I liked the fact that like the musical element was like ingrained to the animation loop for everything in the world. Oh, so you yeah. walk around and there's like the tick tock of the entire world around yep, you, yep. Yeah, that was uh, which cool. um, it kept me in the beat. Like after the first cutscene, like ended, I was just like in the beat and I was like grooving with the game super hard. Uh, I thought it was awesome as heck. Awesome as heck. It was <laughs> groovy. Um, and um, I also think, I saw a lot of stuff about the game, like that this looks like a PS3 and a 360 title. And that's actually really couldn't be far further from the truth. Like in terms of like, you wouldn't get it like at 60 FPS on a PS3 or 360. You wouldn't get the cool looking character models and the effects work. You wouldn't get like the really neat SSR effect they have where it like blends in like a comic book. Um, yeah, like half tones. Yeah, like half tones and stuff. And, like there's a lot of stuff that they're using actually high tech to make this look 
the way you see it here. Yep. Uh, and in full 3D, like the Guilty Gear games, for example, they exist in a PS3 version, but it's like a 2D game. It's a 2D plane, yeah. It's a 2D plane. Like there's a lot that you can manipulate there. Maintaining that at 60 FPS requires a lot more power and they did it really well. And it's one of the U- one of the smoothest UE4 games you can play. UE4, yeah. I don't like the engine at on all. On PC um, especially, where so like, <laughs> mostly yeah. free of it, stutters and so issues. So like, it's like, it's, I, I'm so happy. And I, I hope Microsoft and I hope Tango, I hope they make a lot of money off of this. I hope they get all the success in the world because I want to see more games like this. Uh, I'm way more excited from this style of game and like level of ambition and confidence as Oliver put it, than like a lot of other titles like this super excited me at the beginning of the year. Absolutely. It's just Mm -hmm. phenomenal work. And man, the first time you get into some of these boss fights though, and the music kicks in and it's just, what a, what a game, what a game. And it was a surprise release too. Nobody saw it coming. I personally would put, say that this is the best looking and best Xbox game of the year. In fact, yeah, I think this I'd is the agree. best thing that they did, and by I agree with that. it's and nobody saw it coming. It's just it's a masterpiece. So, way to go to Tango Bravo. GameWorks. They did it. Uh, but while we're talking about colorful, cartoony visuals, <laughs> I kind of wanted to shift to something a little different. I proposed this one for the list because I think it's so confident in what it does, and it's a perfect example of of tailoring your presentation to the hardware spec. Super Mario Wonder. So this is obviously a side-scrolling game, right? But what they're doing visually, I think, and actually this kind of follows along with Hi-Fi Rush where they kind of use some decimated animation, uh, but also a lot of stuff with like perspective to give the 3D characters and 3D objects the sense of actually being really 2D sprites. So they finally managed to conquer the issues that the new Super Mario Brother games had where it just felt floaty. It looked like these 3D models running around in the 2D scene. It, it never felt quite right. Mario Wonder is so responsive and so beautifully animated and architected that it just feels perfect. Uh, and then you cu- couple that with the background work and like the general sense of liveliness and animation, like everything is animated. Uh, and when you get some of those, those crazy flowers, the way everything just goes, it's the Wonder Seeds. Uh, the whole world just comes alive in a way that's like shocking and surprising and often with visual effects that you don't often see. And every stage is unique. It's like they don't repeat the Wonder Seed things, right? They're always new, always fresh, constantly throwing things in your face and just surprising you. And to me, that was uh, that was genuinely captivating. And that's why I felt like it needed to be on this list, even if it's not, you know, it's it's different from some of these other titles. But... I think uh, it, it goes up there. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think, uh, Oliver? I I completely concur with John. I think it looks superb. Um, I think it does follow a little bit with what we were saying about Hi-Fi Rush, where they are trying to emulate some characteristics of other media or older titles in this case, with the kind of decimated animation, but still the smooth scrolling of the characters up and down and, and back and forth. Um, I think it looks superb. I love the Wonder Seeds. I've played um, a few hours of it, and I think it's one of the more impressive titles I've seen on Switch in a while. And I also think it's one of those games that really does make you think, hey, Nintendo could keep <laughs> developing games on this hardware for 10 years, <laughs> and I wouldn't be upset. Because uh, yeah, right? um, they do such a great job keeping everything super uh, great looking and super clean on that class of hardware. In a way and that you, smooth. yeah, just don't see from hardly anyone else. It's super impressive. Yeah, shockingly alias free for a Nintendo game is all described. Also you know, true. Like, yeah, it's very clean. yeah. As, as I, I've always said, like Nintendo doesn't know what anti-aliasing is, but <laughs> apparently they do after all this time. It just it was taking a while. Um, yeah, I'm gonna agree with you guys too. I, I I remember when John before the game came out, we were trying to figure out what was going on actually with the rendering, and. The, that's always an interesting thing. Like you usually don't have that with like a Nintendo game. It's usually kind of transparent because there's limited resources there on the console. So they they used a number of tricks that are just not visible to the the player to make the game look as good as possible on the hardware, given the constraints. And that's that's what a good console game is. And I also think good console games, like this targeting this like not faltering 60 FPS is really important too. Absolutely. This is a gosh darn good console game. That's the way to put it. 
They know exactly how to utilize the hardware to deliver precisely the right visual look without sacrificing fluidity, which cannot be said for many, many Switch games this year, especially. <laughs> yeah. It was not a good right. year for performance on the Switch, right? Uh, but Nintendo, Switch, they, they kept on going, and I respect that a lot. So uh, one more title on this unordered list, and then we get to the debate. And this one, I think, uh, goes up here as well. And it's Spider-Man 2. Marvel Spider-Man 2, if you will. And this is this feels like a continuation of the work that they had done previously. But it pushes out some new techniques. And sort of, I think it stands as one of the best examples that we've seen of ray tracing in the console space. And it's a good example of using what limited capabilities the consoles have for ray tracing uh, in a way that is actually super effective for the visual style of the game and the type of gameplay you engage with, uh, but also shockingly performant, mm -hmm. right? Because they're just they're doing ray traced reflections on everything all over the place, including water this time. Uh, and they all they do it at a very stable 30 or 60 or I guess 40 frames per 40. second. Yeah. And heck, it, you know what? They haven't unlocked. That's another reason it should be on the list is that it has all these display options, right? You can uncap the frame rate. You can use VRR. You can do 30, 40, 60 or higher. All these different options are available to you to allow you to customize the experience based on your display. And and, you know. I think that's wonderful, and I think Insomniac does that better than anyone else at the moment. So, Alex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm very intrigued that they keep pushing uh, further into the ray tracing space with their with their games. Where uh, it, it was interesting how before the remastered game launch, how people were like dunking on the ray tracing in the like twitter sphere which you should just collectively ignore probably yes. um but like it's like do you understand how hard it is to get ray tracing in a big city and have it look good it's like it's not easy and like Ooh. doing it with like the limited power you have there anyway like they're they're working wonders uh with with the hardware what they have and they tend to do it also really well while adhering to good um like fps caps like yeah they're using like stuff like drs uh very effectively but like we've also seen titles that don't use drs effectively or like you were just talking earlier about final fantasy 16 where there's drs enabled but like the image quality suffers and it's not always hitting the target anyway so it's like it's like a, it's like a question of like what are you doing but they don't have this issue insomniac manages to at least keep those things uh, in check and that aspect of their presentation always very polished um i also like that they're one of the first uh, console titles next to FIFA, where we see strand hair being used a lot, All right. which is also a new frontier for video game rendering, uh, pushing hairs to be small and not like 2D cards on a plane, uh, keeping those things. They did it with Ratchet too, but here uh, I think it's a lot more of an artistic challenge to do human hair, which is much more complex than some sort of Pixar-esque, DreamWorks-esque, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like little wombat and al thing. And also a diverse set of people that have very different hair from one another, and they managed yeah. to tackle all that, including yeah, long yeah. flowing hair. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, uh, doing any different styles of human hair, like, you've got your straight hair, you've got, like, your afro-esque like a 4a to 4d or whatever hairs that are even more challenging in a lot of ways because it requires like to the model to not be biased in certain ways and those are things that actually require a lot of dedicated research and a lot of dedicated artist time to make sure you're doing it right because otherwise you get like the aspect that you see in a lot of character creators from like games from like the mid 2010s where it's like <laughs> you got cornrows and you got a fade and that's about it and like here they actually uh it actually looks good and i'm i actually like that a lot i like it when games allow you to make characters in a, in a really cool way and here obviously you can't make your own character but they represent a lot of different types of people that's hard uh, yeah. in a good way yeah I think that in Spider-Man 2, when you're swinging by at like extreme mock, you know, mock three speeds <laughs> with all of those perspective correct reflections all around you and the skyscrapers, there really isn't anything like that in games. And I think that's really where the Insomniac Spider-Man titles, especially this one, stand out because, you know, that kind of big city traversing it at such speed with all that density, that's really special. Um, I think the character rendering looks great as well, like the hair. 
and all that and some of the visual improvements over the prior games like the new foliage it, it all looks really good some of the micro detail doesn't hold up as well as some of the other games in this list i would say but given the typical right, pace and speed of play it all looks really really good i agree all right with that then We've reached the end of the unordered list segment, and it's time to talk about our top three. Uh, I think I guess we have to reveal what they are first, and then we got to figure out the order they should go in. <laughs> yeah, let's just and make this mess. Let's just do it. So the games that we picked to put at the top three are as follows. Alan Wake 2, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, and Cyberpunk 2077 with Path Tracing. So these games, I think all three of them are pushing technology in new and exciting ways, really pushing the limits of what we can expect from a real-time graphics engine these days. Uh, ray tracing plays a role, which is, of course, critical, or, you know, path tracing in two cases. Uh, I think they're all stunning. I know you guys agree. I'm going <sighs> to... Venture. Man. Venture for us for a third, and we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna this is this is really tricky. For I propose for the number three spot, I want to put Cyberpunk in there at path tracing. And I'll tell you why. Like I think it looks phenomenal. I think it's an incredible achievement, but it's also kind of an existing game. And you know, I think it's a game that was already stunning before they added that in, and I think it does add a lot to it. But, you know, it's, man, this is, this is tough to put in order. Like, it's, cause, <laughs> cause it, it's really like, it's a technical, yeah. like I say, huge technical accomplishment, but I just think what we see in the other two is just ever so slightly a step above. And some of it has to do with other elements of those games, worlds and the visuals they're reproducing, but it's, it's very yeah. close. Let me, like, let me give an example. I'm, I'm going to agree with John and put Cyberpunk 2077 on the third place. And first, I want to talk about why it's already a great looking game. Um, for example, like even without path tracing, uh, we already considered it one of the best ray tracing implementations when it released back yeah, in 2020. 100%. We were really, we gave it best graphics of the year back then. Yep. Uh, fast forward. Um, you add path tracing into it and you actually get to see like the most consistent lighting presentation that is arguably possible in a video game. And it elevates the graphics up another level entirely. A lot of the little things that the game originally had there are now amplified extremely. Like the game relies a lot on heavy neon lighting. Yeah, you had some ray trace emissives the first time around, but now you get like the ray trace emissive bounce with like perfect uh, oh. reister based uh, like um, direct shadows. Then the bounce from that at least two times in the environment on both the fuse and specular. And it leads to a lot of scenarios that both uh, that, for example, other games on this list could never possibly do. Like where you get like reflections in reflections, which uh, just look incredible. And given the game's art style of focusing heavily on metallic man-made glass structures uh like carbon fibers uh i don't know uh, shiny plastics all these things it's actually kind of perfect for it and the city environment itself with all the large structures constantly getting in the way of direct sunlighting uh makes it so that these scenes that otherwise without path tracing look oh pretty great now look really really good I would say the only aspects that makes me want to put it at third, one is slightly, uh, I'm going to call it DF political, where we gave it already at once before, and it kind of just feels weird to give it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. two, the, actually the better reason is because path racing elevates the game extremely, but there are still some aspects of it that are left over from the fact that it, yes, it ran really poorly on Xbox One uh, and PS4, but it had a longer development, so there's different uh, times when assets were made, for example, in the game. And there, so you see like varying degrees of texture quality is one thing you see in the game. You see varying degrees of how level of detail is handled. It's really great for some things, not so great for other things. Um, but, you know, like for me, this is, it's also a little arbitrary. I, I love, I love loading up the game and just looking at it too, uh, which is 
always an accomplishment. Like I still load up old games that I think look great and walk through them and admire them. So I'm going to be doing this also for a very, oh, very long time. I also want to, it's a small nitpick, but uh, I think this is the weaker implementation of Ray Reconstruction right now, where right. it still kind of has a somewhat smeary AI upscaled look. But then if you don't use Ray Reconstruction due to the high contrast in many of the scenes, it is a little bit noisier than say yeah, like and, Alan Wake 2, which we'll talk and you, about. Yeah, if you don't use raise use rate reconstruction in the game too, you don't get like uh, highly responsive reflections, yeah, or highly respo- or highly uh, 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 how do you call it like detailed reflections. There's a lot of things like where you really want rate re ray reconstruction on for the gameplay, but there's aspects of ray reconstructions which are negatives, which impact the visuals, which is exactly. a shame, which is a shame, unfortunately. I agree, uh, mm-hmm. Oliver. What are your takes on this? Do you agree um, with us putting this in the slur- third slot? Yeah, so I would agree with it being third, mostly not really for uh, any reason that's related too much to the quality of the visuals. I think what they've achieved here (laughs) is really, really good, mostly for the political reason that I don't think (laughs) that a ray tracing remaster of the game should be number one or number two, maybe, just because it looks superb, but it is an existing title. Um, But I do want to say a little bit about the the lighting because i think that like in a typical rasterized game like people don't really understand i think how impressive path tracing can look in a game like cyberpunk because in a typical rasterized game you know you might have a great looking scene right but then you look at it from another angle where you get closer and the specular doesn't look right the shadow maps are too coarse they have aliasing or and they're uniformly sharp and the light maps have obvious stair-stepping edges and you move uh, an object or a character and all of a sudden the lighting kind of breaks and you move the camera up and down and you get screen space artifacts and the ambient occlusion gets messed up and the screen space reflections get messed up. And this is like what we're used to seeing from so many games that are rasterized. And here you just see almost none of that. Like it's it's just so, so high quality of the lighting presentation and almost always looks mm-hmm. correct. Absent like some image quality concerns, even with three reconstruction, which... I think could be improved probably mm-hmm. um it just looks correct and i think that's impressive that would be impressive for a game that had a limited scope that was a linear you know eight to ten hour adventure but in the context of a gigantic open world game with like 100 hours of content it's just uh super super impressive because open world games don't tend to have this really high quality lighting presentation at all um in my experience right so I, I think that's okay. those are all points that's favor. The the points that take away, I think I totally agree with Alex, where the underlying game is still a little bit of an older vintage than other titles on this list. And so some of the asset quality isn't isn't quite there relative to some of their titles on this list. And uh that detracts from it a little bit, but still, I mean, the progression of yeah. path tracing in games is is quite a sight to behold, and to have this game a game of this caliber fully path traced or very close to fully path traced it's quite impressive i agree okay mm-hmm. so i think we, we all agree are, there that was we great are, we're unanimous <laughs> unanimous. On this then. so number three is what this is but i think one and two this this gets a lot more difficult and i myself have not decided yet either <laughs> so i kind of want to talk through these and then we'll kind of maybe figure it out Cause so like yeah alan that wake, makes sense actually right like alan wake 2 you look at it it's a much smaller scale it's a very dark dim kind of subtle game visually but i think it's one of the most consistent and beautifully lit examples of real time rendering we've ever seen every scene yes. is oozing with just insane detail. There's barely ever a rough edge to be seen. And the way it utilizes ray tracing to enhance this produces results that almost look like you could pull them straight out of an actual film. Mm-hmm. You know, like that f- first time you walk into that, into the Oh dear diner. Yeah. And you just look at those tables and the way the light, you know, floods into the room. It's it's not a it's not a brightly lit diner. It's it's dark. They have the lights pretty much off. You're relying on natural light spilling in through the windows and the doors. But the way it just enters the room and bounces around and sort of gives it that ambient light level. The way all the materials of different roughness reflect that back. Uh, you know, because the world's basically a giant mirror with variable roughness, right? And that's yeah. that's exactly the feeling you get from these types of scenes. 
But the thing is, the thing that's really nuts about all of this is that you have these kind of simple scenes that, you know, but the game takes you to so many places, so many different types of scenes and worlds, and there's all these little tiny objects and little meticulous things always in the scene. Uh, exp- and then you go on out, you're exploring the city with all those signs, you know, you're exploring like the game show space, some of the stuff they do, like the, the dancing scene, for instance, with all those projected mm-hmm. uh, sequences happening around you. Uh, it's It goes beyond just this remarkable path tracing, and it's more like the flexibility of the types of, of sequences they're able to produce in this game, and just like the way they're able to mess with the player and create visually intriguing uh, and just artistically gorgeous sequences. I think it's just, it's an absolute masterclass in terms of overall visual design and a perfect marriage of art and technology. And it's 100% their own artistic vision, uh, yeah. which, right. And we'll talk about Ava- Avatar. Amazing. We'll get to that. But that is basically designed to look like the films, right? Where this is all remedy and it's striking. Uh, so that's yeah. my thoughts first on, on Al- what, what do you think on Alan Wake 2 I, f- I feel like Alex is Mr. Path Trace over there uh, is the Rayman you are the Rayman it's the now. Ray you're, you're the current generation of Rayman I'm the current gen Rayman uh, all Path Traced okay all the time uh, I, so this one is cool there's so many things like I when I saw the game at Gamescom I was like super like blown away with it and I saw a presentation back then that was using their uh, path tracing with ray reconstruction. And I just like went to John, who didn't get to see this presentation. And Rich, I was like, dude, graphics of the year, Elm Wake 2's got it. <laughs> it's got it like immediately. Like I said, like there's nothing that beats this. Um, and then I got the game in my hands. And uh, it does a lot of things that I that I really, really adore. John talked about the Odier Diner scene as being kind of like the subtlety of materials. Uh, but one thing that they also nailed down is that a lot of the just superfluous things around the environment are all like ridiculously high res. They, I think the the scope, the fact that they're limiting the where you can look and walk yep. around yep. is allowing them to just like amp up a lot of the detail in a lot of scenes. And part of that is because they are pushing new technology on PC and consoles. They are using the new geometry pipelines right. offered by modern GPUs to increase the amount of geometric fidelity you can see in any one scene. Another thing that's kind doing, of their take on nanite basically, yeah. right? Like it's like micro yeah. geometry, like, so very small, very small geometric detail that uh, is called away. So you can keep it on screen without having to LOD as often. Uh, the, also, I, I like, so the one thing that we have to talk about with path tracing that you don't get, for example, like in Spider-Man or when we get to Avatar, is that like usually in a path trace game, the reflections and the quality of the world that is being ray traced against, something that you don't get in UE5 game, for example, as well too, is it is the same quality almost Mm -hmm. like more or less the exact same quality as the primary view rendering which makes it a lot heavier so people like are like why is this so heavy it's like dude it's like rendering the game like a bunch of times like per pixel it's crazy (laughs) um and and that leads to things where like you don't see a lot of the issues that you see in other games that use real-time ray tracing as a result um you start to get like minor effects like reflections within reflections uh if you were in path in cyberpunk or in alan wake if you were to find like a pinhole in a leaf and there was an entire world behind it it would actually do a pinhole camera effect it's just thing is the game doesn't have the art set up to allow you to do that really easily the lighting is accurate enough to do to start doing minor phenomena of lighting and that leads to a wholly consistent presentation where like oliver said earlier like with cyberpunk where you move the camera down it doesn't get weird and awkward <laughs> like you'd see in other titles. And here it just like keeps the consistency all the way I think through. a good example of that, Alex, is like, again, right in the diner, like on some of those tables, they have like like dishes that are very yeah. smoothly rendered, right? With like the subtle material work on it. When you look at the reflection and it retains that high polygon look. Uh, you actually see the underside of the bowl, which wouldn't happen with SSR, for instance. Uh, oh. You know, and it retains all the shading, all the lighting, all like the the subtlety of that model in the reflection, and and it's lit. 
you know, with that gorgeous indirect lighting and it just creates something that's super cohesive. Yeah. Uh, Oliver. <laughs> yeah. I mean, geez, what do I, what do I add to all that? I think it's just, uh, well, I'd say that even on consoles, you know, it, it still looks really, really good. You still get a lot of that lighting presentation and indeed the baked lighting is kind of shared across the game, including, I believe in the path raised implementation. Some of the baked lighting is still there. So right. it's still like, it still looks really superb on consoles. When you look at little elements like Alan Wake's coat, when you're in that kind of New York city area, just the way that light plays off of it. I mean, the material response is to die for it. Just looks so, I've never seen something look so correct. The piece of clothing looks so correct in a video game before. <laughs> and yeah, I mean the, the models just like outstanding. A lot of the time, like in the retirement home, I was just looking around and being like, this looks like it's pulled from a CG film. Just like John said, Yep. there's a wild Plus amount of the, the Ray reconstruction works uh, flawlessly, oh, yeah. I would say. It's basically yeah, perfect it's, in this. Yeah. 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 It's like 99%. Um, it's great. There's so much geo in every environment. It, it, it's just a hard game. It's a hard game for me to even pick it apart because it looks like so good at, at a level that I almost have trouble critiquing because it's, it's, especially on PC, when you turn on path tracing oh, yeah. and you have that recon Ray reconstruction driven image, which just looks like so pristine. You know, you, the image quality like this in the path traced title is is just insane. Um, it, yeah, it so I know good. what you mean. Like, yeah, it's it's really splitting hairs when we come to this level of rendering. Um, like, in just in terms of like minor things, John you, or Oliver, you mentioned like the, and this is one thing that I want to talk about when we get to Avatar. But like when you get to like the, like when you do see that they're blending in some of whatever their non ray traced GI is over into the path traced image like you start seeing like errors as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. And that is like, like it's like one of the few minor blemishes in the game. Maybe it has positive effects that I talked about in my video, but also when it like, when there's like a misaligned uh, shadow on an object, it just feels awkward in a game that otherwise has never had that before. So like it stands out in comparison to other aspects of the game that are pretty much flawless. Uh, that's really about, it's like really like one of the few negatives. <laughs> It's, it's otherwise yeah it's yeah re really good i also think yeah, like okay. the bvh yeah. with all the like skinned mes meshes being represented correctly and all that stuff that's that's a big thing yeah that's that's a big thing too like we usually we're so used to seeing like ray tracing games where like the shadows don't move correctly with the bushes or the bushes are just straight like most in most games actually bushes and trees will just not move at all in the ray tracing mm -hmm. if you look and uh yeah that that, that definitely shows up Oh, and the fact that they're doing all this while having some environments absolutely packed with foliage uh, is nuts. Because you, you don't often see that. Although, our next game, there's a lot of foliage in there. And so, uh, we'll, we'll try to talk about some of the nitpicks with each game. But I, now I want to talk about Avatar Frontiers of Pandora and what it does special. And the first thing I thought of was like, oh man, this is like the follow-up to Crisis 1 I've always wanted <laughs> in some ways, just in terms of like representing a properly dense jungle environment with just an insane level of granularity and animation and all the foliage and there's just so much life in this world combined with uh, extremely impressive lighting. It's it's genuinely... Uh, it's just it's just something you look at and you're like wow that's that's stunning and alex actually you did a massive pc sort of tech focus not tech focus but you know a, a showcase video talking about all this and i remember when you were working on this you're like oh man this just made the graphics of the year discussion like difficult now and it's such a different thing compared to alan wake and that's also what makes this difficult because i think it is up there but they're so different. Why don't you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, like the difference between Avatar and uh, Alan Wake is essentially it's a scope and it's also a little bit about game goals. Like right. Alan Wake 2, very, I mean, there is some modularity into how this game can be structured when you're playing specifically as Alan Wake. And there is like when you're walking around a saga in the forest sections, you can go from place to place and it is a bit more open. But obviously Avatar has this large, no loading screen connected world with multiple biomes in it. 
And that means you have to tackle, tackle very different technical problems. And one thing that I want to say that I really like, and it's why I've always liked games like Doom 3 and Avatar comes in there and Crisis, is it's going for like this, it's trying to mimic real life by using systems-driven approaches to tackle them. And obviously, I say real life here in great quotation marks because it's taking place on an alien world filled <laughs> with fantastical sites. But it is trying to bound itself by realistic concerns. And a part of that, okay, we can talk about race chasing later, but I want to talk first about how the world is like populated. Like, You create like a series of rule sets by designers that say like, okay, we have this large asset zoo in front of us of different plants that have different lore reasons for existing in different parts of the world. Like they're in the swamps, they're on the plains, they're next to riverbeds, they find themselves at the base of certain trees, etc. And they try and populate the world using these systems that are designed by designers to procedurally place things. There is handcrafting in all of this, obviously, too. They can place down individual perfectly handcrafted things if they want. But then they're anchored in the terrain uh, with like perfect smoothing along the edges to make sure it doesn't look weird. And then procedural placement then aids in... The, embedding it in the world and i think avatar does it really 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 well i think it it doesn't fall into the usually like kind of strange look some open worlds have where they have like a slight manufactured look or they have a slight overly procedural look to them right, right. where like we talked about with no man's sky with oliver uh, recently with uh rich where it was really obvious that this was just like all procedural stuff the proceduralism in avatar only aids the presentation and a lot of the things that you're seeing i didn't even talk about in the video because i wanted to let people experience themselves but when you first get your i think they're called i call them banshees but they're called like ecrons in the game or something like that it's your flying mount the mission sure. to get the flying mount is actually a really good super focused linear path mission but it's embellished by all this procedural aspects of it and where the vegetation is placed how it looks as you're running up the thing, the music crescendoing as you jump up in the air into these ever higher structures to get to your flying mount is really, really well done. I didn't want to even talk about the video because I wanted people to experience it firsthand. But as a part of that like procedural thing is that all the lighting, there's unlike Alan Wick 2, there's no fallback to pre-baked stuff. All the lighting in the game has to be real time for the world to even work in the first place. Uh, and they fully committed to ray tracing even on the current gen consoles in a Which whole nuts. Like, mm -hmm. holistic way, like reflections, mm -hmm. GI, bits of the shadows, and even the audio. Like, because, like, imagine if you had to make a world entirely out of placed emitters of audio. It, yeah. wouldn't, it would just sound bad. It wouldn't yeah. sound right. It'd be like fake ambience. You have to, like, somehow make it, like, change and move with the character. Ray tracing is a pretty powerful way to make it do that in a system like systems. And I just love systems driven design. Like it's always yep, yep. inspired me so much since crisis. So that's why I wanted to talk about avatar as, as what it does differently than Alan Wake two, where it's more systems driving a game. My initial visual impression of avatar was really just like those outdoor scenes, which look phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like you see an awe inspiring amount of foliage. Tons of fine detail on the ground, trees, mosses, and grass. Like even, I mean, I'm thinking back to like Horizon Forbidden West, but I don't think that really even comes close to this in terms of the amount of detail in the environment and the fidelity of the lighting of objects in that environment uh, with the RTGI and the RT reflections. Um, the lighting is very consistent and finely detailed even on consoles. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, like... Like uh, like Alex said, I think it's just a, a very convincing and, and really beautiful systems-driven game. And um, it's it's a very different kind of game from Alan Wake, like if we're evaluating these two titles against each oh, other. Yeah. Yeah. Because Alan Wake it's is like, hard. yeah, Alan, Alan Wake is like super handcrafted in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense. It's very limited. It's got a scope that is like, it's it's like a decently long game, but it's it's a totally different scope than an open world title like Avatar. And I kind of think that Avatar on some level is a is a more impressive technical accomplishment. 
I think what they've done with it is is just extraordinary. And even holding up like really well on consoles, like you get two RTFX. They're even targeting yeah. sixty, and they're doing like a pretty credible job of that. Um, whereas like I don't know, Alan Wake two on consoles is like a you know it doesn't have any ray tracing it's good. Or like that. It's good. It, it's good, but it's not quite to the same level of. Of um of just accomplishment in in some sense as Avatar is is doing although actually, both both look phenomenal mm, yeah I, that, yeah dude that's that's actually that, I was just thinking about that that's a really good point as well uh is that I think it is fair to take the console versions into account when discussing this right because mm-hmm. making a console version of one of these games is difficult uh, and the decisions that Mass have made enabling these ray traced effects at this scale and quality on a console it's kind of one of the best examples we've ever seen of that on these machines. Right. Yeah. Which I think is also a feat to be recognized. It's cutting the right corners. And they said it when I talked with them, the interview, like, so like, I love the super pristine aspect that path tracing gives us. And I would love path tracing in avatar. So if you're out there and you look at (laughs) passive, consider path tracing, but I also like the fact that they are trying to get, uh, as they said in the interview, like the best bang for the buck of all the rendering techniques they can throw out there. And that is uh, a balancing act that is hard to do. Um, and they managed to do it across a variety of platforms with very different s- specifications going all the way up to these unobtainium settings on PC, which uh, fine, you know, make the ray trace reflections make the the game still uses shadow maps which is probably like the largest detriment in the entire visual presentation um that's really about it and then obviously like the 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 ray trace reflection resolution is hamped up considerably the only issue in the game like visually that you don't really get in Alan Wake 2 is like you move that camera down and you can see where like the SSR blends in Mm, uh um but like the like the world design i also feel like the interiors while good feel significantly less good than the exteriors in a way that's slightly unbalanced like they they feel a little bit i don't know that it's it's good but there's something about it that just felt a little bit off to me yeah a little bit of inconsistency there yeah yeah. Although I will say that um, some of the artificial environments in particular, and also the open world environments, the more green environments, you'd say, reminded me a lot of Crisis 3. And I just, yeah, I love did. that aspect of it. Like, I, I, oh, I don't yeah. know if they're <laughs> I, I imagine they did take some inspiration. Maybe some employees uh, worked it looks, on both. It they do have cool. some, yeah. they do have some firmware Crytek people. Yeah, I know yeah. that for a fact. So um, I thought that was just really cool because, <laughs> I mean, I played through Crisis 3 recently uh, and I just, I was just reminded of that while playing. It's still it. good. It's it's still phenomenal, but absent Crisis Four, well, we'll have that soon enough. But this is like the next closest yeah. thing in terms of style. It is, yeah, my goodness. And making that video too, uh, we talk about audio. I think Alan Wake too actually has great great audio oh God, uh, yeah. presentation as well. Um, great blending of score with game. Great blending of ambiance with game. Avatar Two has to do it in a very different way because I, it's not narration based. It's it's this is such a hard, <laughs> this is such such a hard know, discussion because we're looking at two very different types. I of know games. exactly. Yeah. Another thing that, uh, that Alan Wake, obviously given its focus, has I think over Avatar is just like character models and character oh, yes. rendering, which mm-hmm. is just like absurd in Alan Wake Two. But right. obviously, this is a very different game. And they do a great job with the Navi, but I feel like the human characters in Avatar are perhaps less, like, they're good, but not stunning. And I would actually say, when I when I think back to Psycho in Crisis 3, during that cutscene when he leans over and looks at you at the beginning, somehow mm-hmm. that still looks better in my mind. <laughs> oh, it does. I'd say it does. It's, it's I think it looks insane. Be- like, I think Psycho looks better than the character models here. But Psycho was also like five years ahead I, of I everyone know. else. I know. But the, the he was, he models, was living up though. to his name. The, the Navi, Navi models, models look better. great, though. <laughs> they they, yeah. they look freaking great. Yeah. 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 yeah, all those Navi in Crisis. Um, but yeah. yeah, this... This is this is hard. I don't know. I, I feel like we've both kind of we've all described these games here, yeah. though. And the interesting thing is that of the three in the top three, um, Avatar has better they, HDR as well. Yeah, Avatar does have really great HDR. I think um, 
they all interestingly have ray tracing and i think that goes to show that like the the next like some of the next level rendering that needs to occur in games is driven by the the scenarios that ray tracing can create that are not necessarily created without it so i think that's a pretty important distinction versus like the rest of the world wow this is this is hard what what are the drawbacks for alan wake 2 i mean i can i can be brave and just say a personal opinion about it Good. And then we can all say, so yeah. for me, I want to just put Avatar at one because it appeals to some of my sensibilities of why I got interested in in rendering. Like I was really inspired by Doom 3 back in the day. I was really inspired by Crisis. For example, when Half-Life 2 and Doom 3 came out, I played a lot of Half-Life 2 and I liked it a lot. And I really liked the, uh, the physics driven aspect of it. But I was just like super fascinated at like this adherence to real time all the time that Doom 3 had. Yeah. To me, it was just Same. like, it spoke to me. And that's what spoke to me about Crisis as you well. Know, so I'm, so I'm very interested in Avatar trying to keep this lineage up of real time all the time, proceduralism. Etc. So I want to put that at one as being like this, technically this discussion cool as heck. Kind of reminds me of back around 2010 when people were talking about Crisis versus Metro 2033 as like oh, yeah, top tier right. graphics because the difference between those games is very similar to the difference between these games uh, oh, in yeah. terms of scope and visual style and everything. Oh, but man, this is. We can have differing opinions. It's no, okay. but like Avatar, <laughs> like I'm, I'm letting your video run now. And just thinking about it, the way it looks in HDR and everything moves, it's so freaking good looking. <laughs> it's so good looking in action. They both are. I, I'm, I'm almost inclined to agree. That's the thing. Even though Alan Wake, like on the on the micro level, feels more impressive. It's just something it about the on the micro level. It is more impressive. It's just this. Yeah. It's just this crazy. Like when you look at the, these forests and you look at the way everything's lit so coherently and beautifully, and it's just so vibrant, and yet runs so smooth. And I think that I I would say the thing that maybe tips it over for me and why I would do it beyond all the things we've said, it is the console version, because I think delivering a console version without having to sacrifice its features that's that's a huge accomplishment like like very much worthy of praise so yeah. i might vote avatar for number 1 just by a hair just by yeah. a hair i would say like in terms of the game that i think looks better in any given shot i would say alan wake 2 right yeah because can, right. they're they're accomplishing a lot within a limited scope of title and the lighting looks outstanding, um, even absent like some little problems with the shadows that you see sometimes because of the baked lighting and things like this. But but it just looks it looks so good in every shot and the variety of the locations. It's it's doing some impressive things and some technically challenging things, maybe that aren't quite on the same scale as achieving an open world Pandora, but are still, you know, very uh, very hard things. And the technology behind it is incredible. But yeah, if absolutely. but graphics is more than just producing a great looking image, and I think what Avatar is doing in terms of hitting uh, multiple ray tracing effects, making those fundamental to the visuals, having like an incredible open world environment where you can go anywhere, where it's so it has so much flexibility in that respect, um, and then achieving all that on power limited and constrained platforms, delivering basically the full feature set visual feature set on an Xbox Series S, <laughs> you know. It's pretty yeah. pretty special. So to me, I, I think that it's it's just a matter of, you know, what do you prioritize in your ranking? But I think in terms of a graphics of the year award, I think that I'd probably give it to Avatar just because I think that that is the more probably technically impressive overall effort in real-time rendering, putting it that way. Real-time rendering. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And real time oh, yeah, emphasis yeah. on real time, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it do, it does. Avatar does feel like an extension of the Crisis model. I think what Crytek was trying to do. I think you're right about that. It's the first time we've had one that's convincingly like that with this sort of jungle like environment as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we haven't really seen much, like progress in that area right like trying to keep all the systemic things alive this kind of dense jungle 
and this sort of coherent lighting. Far Cry certainly hasn't kept that up. That becomes no, somewhat it, formulaic, and it just kind of, you know, it doesn't really work the same way. Um, yeah, the sense man. of scale is completely different in a Far Cry game. It's very interesting, even yeah. though, like, that that was, like, part of the lead-up to the discussion of this, is that the comparisons with other Ubisoft titles and Far Cry came about, and I felt like they didn't jive completely, uh, other than the face level. Yeah, so, like, yeah. even Far Cry 6 has a sort of similar setting, but it does not look anything like this. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near this, near. and it runs worse. Yeah. The CPU, yeah. <laughs> the CPU wise, yeah, yeah. Far, the, the performance on the consoles, like we're talking about, like they achieving this, this, these things while also running on the consoles. Like the game is like ridiculously multi-threaded. Um, it is using your GPU really, really well. If we're talking about options on PC, it has the, it is the best PC port I played this year. Yeah, it's probably per- perfect. I mean, it, it's, it's like it pretty much it just, perfect. It just went. There, it just went and it started and it like had all these things, all these features, all these things you can tweak has like, it has like a benchmark suite. So like rival offline tools, it's, it's, it's so good. A massive have done an incredible job. So I think, I think we've collectively agreed. We've split hairs to do it mm-hmm. though. It's very like close. We both agree that we were both agree that we love Alan Wick too, but I think it's just like, Oliver put it really well. Like the emphasis on like technical achievement and real time rendering across the breadth of systems probably has to go to avatar okay but you know number two for alan wake that's still a remarkable achievement i think and it's a stunning game and then avatar at number one so mm-hmm. there i like we go. this much just yeah. just a little bit just barely <laughs> and we're lucky though that we're any like when you look at the top three though like these, Holy these crap. games it's, like, it's insane <laughs> what's been achieved here this is truly Holy crap. next level stuff Beautiful, beautiful games. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I can't say enough, but I think, yeah. Well done wow. to all these developers. Go I ahead. feel like this year we've seen just so many great looking titles relative to 2022 or 2021. The consoles are oh, yeah. really hitting their stride. We're seeing a lot of console and uh, high, higher end PC exclusive titles or current gen console exclusive titles that really do push out rendering. We're finally starting to see that, I think, across a broad swath of games. And as we approach like 2024, I think we'll see a lot more of these trends. We'll see a lot more high-end engines, including UE5 and whatever we see next from Snowdrop and all this stuff. So I'm really excited that we're finally hitting this generation in stride. And I think this year was a really good showcase for what you can do when you build rendering technology around this class of console and PC hardware. Mm-hmm. absolutely wonderfully oh, said yeah. okay gentlemen i think that well, brings us all the way to the end of this thing uh we managed to figure it out let us know if you enjoyed the format of debate uh hopefully so i thought it was interesting to go through that and we oh, all yeah, kind of awesome. came out in the end and yeah these i think every game on this list obviously including the honorable mentions they're all gorgeous and there's still other great looking games that came out this year as well because frankly it was a it was a great year for visuals. It was not a great year for the industry as a whole sadly, but uh at least in the visual yeah. front there was there was a lot to celebrate. And it was also the year where Unreal Engine 5 got off the ground and started showing up in shipping games and third party games with all those features implemented and largely looking pretty good. It was a bad year for PC ports. There's a video on that. <laughs> Uh, there's a video on that but yeah thanks for uh, joining me for this uh, journey gentlemen it was awesome John Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you Oliver also too for joining us for the first time in this Uh, you're you you better be here next year. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we're gonna make sure he is threat. That's a threat. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> all right. All right, gentlemen. That's gonna do it for this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Congratulations to everyone on the on this list but especially the number one winner avatar frontiers of pandora what a gorgeous game and uh we'll see you in the new year 
MSI's MPG Infinite X2 PC features powerful Intel Core processors, the latest RTX 40 series graphics, and supports DDR5 memory up to 128GB, with advanced CPU cooling via MSI's own 240mm all-in-one cooler and system thermals handled by the Silent Storm Cooling 2 solution. Every major component in the system is upgradable with a toolless design for easy access. A tempered side panel and MSI Mystic Light RGB adds to the aesthetic and the latest Wi-Fi 6E networking is supported. Check the link in the video description for full details on the MSI MPG Infinite X2, the all-new MSI gaming desktop.